All right, welcome back. Uh, I did mention it was going to be a really short break this time. Um, thanks to everyone who transitioned over. And I'm super excited to have Bryce Fernandes with us. Hi, Bryce. Hi. And Bryce is a uh, software engineer and entrepreneur um, residing in London, and he is with WeaveWork. So welcome, and thanks so much for presenting. Um, and Bryce's session today will be focusing on delivering quality at speed with GitOps. And I love this because, you know, as folks transition into more of a CI CD world and really um, enable those things in their projects and in their development um, life cycles and in their standard procedures, as Dormain just walked us through, I think this is really core to making sure that everybody's on the same page with what, um, what GitHop, GitHops, nope, GitOps. That's right. Yes what it is and how to employ it in best practices. So this is fantastic. So thanks so much. And the floor is yours. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to jump straight into a presentation. So I'll share my screen with you all. Uh, and uh, then we can get started. So uh, today, as um, Sonia just said, I'll be talking about GitOps. Um, and really, uh, this is kind of our approach for um, being able to um, improve the speed of delivery, right? So Domain uh, talked in the previous session and the idea is that to um, uh, speed up your delivery. So I'm Brice, I work for Weaveworks. Um, I'm what we call one of the customer success engineers. Um, so I moved from the software engineering and now I do basically work with people to make them successful in particular with cloud native technology. And our team is based behind the GitOps model. That's the model we derived for our internal use. Uh, and hopefully you can get some benefits from this. So why this talk? This talk is really to give you new ideas about how to operate your systems and to inspire some changes uh, in your organization on how you work. And I'll, I'll dive straight in, talk about GitOps, show you um, how GitOps has transformed an organization and then maybe we'll go into some demo if we have some time. So the first question is, what is GitOps? You might have heard this term before. I'm gonna try and give you kind of my definition of GitOps. It's an operational model first. It's how you operate your infrastructure and your uh, clusters and your systems. It's derived from computer science um, knowledge and operations knowledge that we've gained over several years, particularly working with Kubernetes. So I'll be using Kubernetes, which is one of the kind of the founding stone project for the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And really, this is the approach we found works best for running Cloud Native apps. It's technology agnostic, really, and name notwithstanding. So we, we talk about GitOps, and, and we really like Git, but the approaches are really more about the principles. It's about why instead of just how and which tool to use. Although, obviously, people like us and other companies do provide tools. So if you want to care about how, get in touch afterwards. And, and really, why you should care about this is it's a way to speed up your team. It's a way to make your team go faster. Uh, and really, kind of um, what Domain was talking about um, when we, I think it was one of the companies you, uh, she showed where the number of deployments per year moved from 18 to 120. This is really the core of it, what we're really talking about trying to achieve. So uh, uh, this is going to be quite a technical talk. I'm going to talk about the principles of GitOps uh, first. So the first is the entire system should be described declaratively. Now, some of you might have been familiar with um, infrastructure as code. And this is kind of some of the principles here um, that we're talking about. So this is kind of beyond code. It's about data, right? We're declaring the system as data. This is implementation dependent. So uh, any implementation can work with the same set of data. You can change the implementation while keeping the same data. Uh, it's easy to abstract in simple ways. Um, we, we like the data to be text-based because it's nice and readable for humans and for, for machines uh, rather than be in a database. It's very easy to validate for correctness as well. So data is much easier to validate for correctness than code. So these two gentlemen um, spend a lot of their, well, a lot of their work was around um, how do you validate code? How do you make assertions about code, about functions? And it turns out that's very hard. That's a very hard problem. If you've got data instead of code, that's a much easier problem. And it's easy to manipulate and generate from code itself. 
So once you've, how is that different from infrastructure as code? You've heard that before. So a lot of the time, infrastructure as code, um, what happens is people have code and not data to declare to uh, define their infrastructure. And really, the difference here is it's about the consistency in the failure case. So when an imperative system fails, when you have a code that changes your system and that fails somewhere, you end up in an unknown, inconsistent state of your system. So your system basically breaks, and you're not sure what state it's in. Instead, if you're using a declarative approach, um, changes are basically transaction. You can think of changes as, tra as transaction. Um, and, and naturally, this is a very good thing, right? You can go back and forward between these states that are well-defined, and you let the system worry about repeat, repeating the uh, transaction if it fails the first time. So, so now we have these transaction and this declared state. We really want to version control it. And uh, we want a single canonical place that is version controlled for, this, for the dec declaration of what our system should look like. So, so that's done with Git. We use Git to have this canonical desired state of the system. It's a canonical source of truth. Declarative definition means that it's trivial to roll back. Right? You can roll back very easily to a previous known good state by essentially just making a commit or reverting a commit. So we have good tools around state management in that way. It has phenomenal security guarantees for auditing. So Git is a really good um, tool to let you know who, did a who made a change, when, and why. And it has uh, strong cryptographic guarantees around this, uh, including the ability to do things like signed commits if you'll particularly care about the provenance of your code. So you can trace back the code, the provenance of the code, all the way to the individual key um, that kind of created that code. So this, this, these are very good security guarantees for auditing. It lets you build sophisticated approval processes and replicate existing workflows. So, so Git really is a building tool. And on top of that, you can build very sophisticated approval processes uh, to do things with things like pull requests. Let's say you have a pull request and um, you want to have an automated approval to make sure that the pull request matches some arbitrary business control. You can do that with um, ag software agents that review the pull request and approve or deny uh, the change. Uh, and you can also protect certain branches, restrict, restrict write access to certain branches, um, specifically to certain people, or specifically to code that meets a particular criteria. Uh, so there's some very sophisticated tools are built around approval and, and security and processes. And finally, one of the reasons I really like putting everything in Git as text is it makes it a very, very good software and human collaboration point. You have this one central point where human agents change the system, where also software agents change the system. So when a software agent makes a change automatically, you want that change to be recorded somewhere, right? And you want an audit trail. And it basically puts the software and the human agents on the same level. Uh, the next step in kind of making GitOps work for you is to make sure that the changes to the desired state are automatically applied. So when there's a change to the state, it automatically uh, gets moved to your system. So I make a commit in my Git repository that controls my system, that automatically gets applied. And that's really important for your velocity gain. This is how you get faster, right? Getting the automation pipeline going. It's also a great way of separating what happens and how it happens. And it, it means that the privileges and the keys that let you change your infrastructure don't leave your infrastructure because your infrastructure is reacting to a declared state, the declared state can stand outside of the security boundaries. And then the, the things that have control over your infrastructure can stand inside your security boundaries. So you don't have keys, for example, that access your cluster or your infrastructure and live in your continuous integration pipeline, which would be a, a big problem. And, and finally, you want something that continuously monitors your system. These are software agents that ensure correctness and alert you when your system, the running system, diverges from the declared state you're looking for. So you're continuously checking that the desired state is met. Uh, this means that the system can self-heal. It means that you can recover from errors um, without intervention. And particularly, the particular class of error here isn't, um, these are not hardware errors, software errors. 
These are operator error, right? The problem exists between chair and keyboard and chair. There's an operator error. Let's say I, I delete a machine that should not be deleted. My system will notice and will reapply the configuration and make sure the machine exists, even if the machine has been deleted manually. So essentially, it's a control loop for your operation. So the four principles are the entire system is described declaratively. The canonical desired system state is versioned. The changes to the desired state are automatically applied. These are authorized changes. The software agents ensures correctness and alert on divergence. So you have software agents, people, changing a canonical source of truth, and then some software agents that change your system. In this case, we do a lot of work with Kubernetes, and Kubernetes supports that approach natively. It has a declarative API uh, to define objects. So really, it's a great fit for this approach. So really, I, I like to think of it as functional reactive programming for your infrastructure. Uh, it's like React, but for your server and applications. So in React, when you change the state of uh, your data, uh, the view automatically changes for your user. You don't have to worry about it. It's essentially the same approach, but for your infrastructure and your clusters. So, so what should actually make it under this approach? What, what should you actually add to your GitOps uh, pipeline? What should be GitOps? And, and, I, and I'm very sorry for using GitOps. I think that's a terrible uh, sin against the English language, but I hope you understand what I'm, I'm trying to get. What should be in that uh, set of things that we're going to manage using GitHub? That declare uh, configuration. So in this case, we have Kubernetes manifests. There's a declaration of which applications are running, how many should be, how many replicas should exist, etc. Um, your networking routes, your networking configuration should be in there. Provisioning scripts. Um, ideally, you'd use provisioning that provisions machines and hardware in a declarative way. Terraform is wonderful for doing that. So all your Terraform files. Um, your dashboards, uh, kind of going further from what you're traditionally managing in, in Git to some things that you might not be managing in that way. Uh, your dashboards should be managed in, in, that, in, in this way. Uh, your alerts, your playbook. So playbooks or runbooks are operating manuals for your infrastructure. Uh, and they have information about the state of your system that is relevant when an alert goes off and the on-call engineer is woken up at 3 in the morning because these things do happen. Um, they also have routine maintenance procedures. How do I create a new machine? How do I delete one? Well, those things should be versioned. It's better if you can link the change in the playbook to the change in your system. So let's say you uh, change an application. You should see that there's a link between the application change and the playbook change, either in the same commit or either in the same merge uh, commit from a different branch. Uh, further, kind of going beyond those things, we can talk about application checklists. So those are automated verifications that ensure that the applications you deploy on your infrastructure um, subscribe and, and um, use the constraint that you have and the policies that you have. So these are great for uh, security policies, let's say. So you can have security policies and you can declare those, say all applications must adhere to these security policies and you can have a declaration of the security policies, and then you can have your pipeline enforce these policies before the application gets to your production environment. And obviously, you need a place to store these policies. It should be in your Git repository. Um, recording rules, so some of the metrics, uh, how do, which metrics you are recording, which metrics you are using, how you're recording metrics. These should all be GitOps as well. Um, so in particular, things like Prometheus metrics, declaration of Prometheus rules, all of that. If you're using cloud native technology, the configuration for those things, the configuration for your monitoring, the configuration for your log management, all of that should be in your repository. And finally, secrets, right? You, you want a version control secrets. And what I would say is use the sealed secrets from Bitnami. It's a, a, a tool that lets you manage secrets in this way without ever letting plain text secret anyway in your repository, which is a, a big security problem. So, so you encrypt your secrets, and then you put encrypted binary blobs, essentially, in your configuration files that then can be version controlled and managed properly. Um, and that, that's a really great way of managing secrets. So that's kind of a everything, really. We're, we're talking about trying to get up everything that defines your system. Uh, and the idea here is that 
you want to be able to recreate a brand new system based on the declarations with zero additional effort, right? There should be a, a command, just like you have a single command to build code, right? We, we all, as developers, we all very familiar with the idea that there should be a single command at the root of the repository that builds your entire code. The same thing is true for your infrastructure. So now I'm going to go into a little bit of a, a kind of a talk about how GitOps was applied at a company called Cordoba. So Cordoba uh, does machine learning on advertising and promotion. Um, and moving to GitOps uh, let them reduce the time needed to fix software bugs by about 60%. So that's, that's a less than half of the time um, that they were used to before for fixing a bug. Responding to customer requests, about 43% uh, less time. And uptime went up. So they were moving faster. And you'd expect that more changes would mean more problems. But actually, what you actually you end up with is because you're more confident in your changes, because you're it's easier to revert back if something goes wrong, then your uptime goes up. You have fewer incidents. Uh, and we're talking to move from between about two deployments per week, which is about 100 deployments a year, to about 150 deployments per week. Um, and this, these numbers are, are the real thing, right? That's the GitOps effect of being sure of your deployment, having a really good um, security and safety net when you're making deployment and changes to your system. So, so why, why does that speed up effect occur, right? Well, it occurs because you're re really talking about some sort of loop, right? You have a loop where you monitor your system, you modify it, you create the declaration to modify it, you implement it. Um, and really, you're automating most of this, right? You're, you're concentrating the humans on the thing that they can actually do well, and the rest is done by software agents. So the first thing is software making commits. When you create a new version, you can do continuous deployment, and the software will change your configuration files um, for you as appropriate. Um, you can automate the, the, the changes you make are safe and reversible and are also automated by software. You've got continuous deployment. And finally, you have automated templated dashboards. That's dashboards that you can declare. You can use templating languages to declare dashboards and define them. Uh, and I'll show you a little bit of an example uh, later. So it's a feedback loop. This is what makes your organization go faster. So pay attention to your feedback loops and try and make them smaller, right? That's, that's really the idea, make them faster. So um, now I'll talk a little bit more about how we apply uh, GitOps internally at Weaveworks. We've got a little bit of time to go through this. So don't mind that there's a lot on the slide. Don't need, you don't need to read it at all. I'll go through it step by step and talk about some of the features of our GitOps approach internally. So the first thing is we use Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes is declarative um, natively. It has a declarative API. You declare um, resources and entities and objects. Um, so it fits really well with that approach. Um, it's all in YAML, it's all machine and human readable, all the configuration. Uh, the next step we use is we use Kubernetes operator. These are agents that run on in our infrastructure that make changes based on declarations, right? So they, you'll change the declaration and the operator will pick up that change and make a change to your infrastructure, which is wonderful, it works really well. Um, and these, these are open source. And so to give you a, a, an idea of what that looks like, I'll jump and give you a small, very quick demo of an operator in, in actual practice. So I'm, I'm here in our, in our product, and I'm going to jump into the deployment section of our product. So here we can see that we have several services running in a cluster. So this is, I think it's a three-node cluster. Let me, uh, let me double check. Yeah, it's a three-node cluster running on Google Cloud Engine. And I can take a look at the running services. And I can notice that, for example, my front end is running behind the latest available version. So I'm going to be able to update my front end. And when I update it to the latest version, what we'll see is we'll see two events occurring when I press the Release button. So the first event is going to be the creation of a new commit. The commit is going to change the configuration files to move to the new version. And the second event is the system reacting to that commit and moving the new version into our production environment. So let me show you what the commit looks like. So this is me jumping straight into GitHub, 
where we keep the control repository for our infrastructure. And you can see the software agent has actually made a commit. We Flux as the agent has made a commit when I click that button. Uh, to just give you an idea, this uh, we have a folder full of Kubernetes manifests. Let me uh, show you what that looks like quickly. So in the deploy Kubernetes folder, these are in the manifests. These are the manifests that define the application, the running application. Now there are other manifests in this repository. There are other tools in this repository that declare things like the cluster, the infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, but really, Flux works with the Kubernetes manifest at that particular level. So we, we use multiple clusters, staging and production. We do continuous deployment into staging, uh, and we do manual promotions from staging to production, which is a really common way of working. It's what a lot of our clients use, use as well. And, and really, now you come to the problem of how do you, com do you make changes between, um, to move changes between two clusters? So in this case, I can go back to my application. <coughs> Take a look at the resources. And I'm currently comparing my cluster's version, the state of my cluster, to the very latest available. But instead, what I can do is uh, compare it to another cluster. In this case, I'm comparing it to another cluster. And we can see that the, the versions here are different as well. Now, let's say I wanted to Deeming it, bringing it back. To, I'm bringing my cluster. It's not found in the change. But the idea is here that you can compare different states of uh, different clusters. I could choose a different uh, another cluster to compare against. Uh, this one has quite a different set of uh, versions, for example. So this is the tool we use to do promotions between our production and development environment. Uh, and this is all driven through Git, right? All of this is driven through Git and the GitOps. We also have automated diff tools. So we, we call them diff operators. They're all open source. Uh, and the idea here is that these tools compare the running version of our cluster with uh, the definitions in our Git repository. And that includes comparing the Kubernetes manifests at the Kubernetes level. It includes comparing machines manifests um, at the Terraform level, machine provision, using Ansible. So there's a lot of tools that continuously monitor the system to ensure the state is as expected. If they fail to, um, if they're not in the state expected, the tools will take remedial actions. And if the remedial actions fail, we'll get alerted as operators. Um, this is an example, for example, of um, a, a tool letting us know that there's a change, a difference in the configuration um, in Git to the reality on the cluster, right? So this is a very explicit tool. This is taken from our development cluster. This is an alert that we get sometimes when we are doing manual interventions, uh, and you can see what that looks like. And our alert definition are in Git as well, right? So this example here is an example of how we've applied that approach, that GitOps approach, beyond just our infrastructure to things like our security rules. So in this particular case, we're applying that um, approach to our uh, GitHub repositories and our GitHub security rules. So we have here definitions in Terraform using the Terraform GitHub provider of um, what, the, um, what the security should be like on our GitHub setup. And this is showing you the alert definition in Git, in Git of what happens when the security definitions in our repository don't match reality, right? We get an alert. Um, and this is one example of the definitions that we're talking about. The resource of membership, that's my GitHub username. And I'm added to the, the um, organization as an admin. In fact, because we've used that approach, what we can do is we've used a ratchet pattern, which is a really good way of thinking about this, which is we've encoded, when we move to uh, using this approach to manage our security rules, we encoded the actual rules. And then what we did is we, slowly moved to stricter and stricter and stricter rules so that today I'm no longer an admin of this. I don't need to be. What I can do is propose a change as a pull request. I don't need to, if I want to add a new member to GitHub, add a customer, add a partner, whatever that is, 
um, then instead of needing to be admin, I can create a pull request on the repository that contains the configuration. And then this pull request will be reviewed. When it's approved, it will be merged into a protected master branch so that and then the system will automatically react to apply those new changes to our GitHub repositories. Our dashboard definitions are also in Git. Uh, we've created a tool called GrafanaLib, which specifically lets you, it's a small DSL that lets you define dashboards and use templating. This is an example. Um, it's not all that interesting. I think if you squint a little bit, what you'll see is it's basically JSON, right? It's basically just data. What is interesting is this single line actually turns into something much larger, much more complex because of data templating, right? So that single line actually turns into this QPS graph. So we've got a single line turning into a query per second graph. So it's a way of generating dashboards. And that line at the bottom, we've encoded our entire monitoring approach in a single line so that when we call that line, it actually creates multiple graphs with a particular monitoring approach. So we're, we're in this case, we're um, monitoring both the queries per second error rates as well as latencies for the um, mean 50th percentile, 99th percentile. So with a single line, I'm creating those very complex graphs because I'm using a data language, essentially. So um, we have read-only access to production for all developers. So that means every single developer in the organization has access to the current running state of the system. There's no secrets. There's no um, implications of security because we, we're keeping everything encrypted properly. So it allows developers to create a local environment that perfectly matches production. There's no difference. You're using the same configuration files to create it. And um, this means that if tomorrow I wanted to recreate the entire infrastructure on a different uh, cloud provider account, let's say I change the AWS account, we lose the root key, I recreate a new um, Amazon account, reapply everything, people will be reapplied, users will be reapplied, code will be reapplied, et cetera. The only thing we'd lose, obviously, is the data. And we have gated pull request driven changes to production. So all of these things together mean that um, we have a cluster recovery time that's under 30 minutes. That's mean if, if we push the button nuke everything, we can bring back our infrastructure up in about 30 minutes. Uh, obviously, we'll, we'll lose the data if the data has been lost, but the running service will still be up and running. Uh, and we can restore the data from backups when it's running. Uh, we make dozens of changes per day with a very small team. So changes are happening on multiple times per hour, um, sometimes more frequently. Uh, we have multiple teams making changes to our production environment at the same time with zero issues. Uh, we have an incredibly fast regression response time. When something goes wrong, it's very, very easy to just jump back to a previous known good state. In fact, I've had the experience of being in a customer meeting talking to somebody on Skype, and they had a problem, that, that we had a bug in our user interface. And so what I did is I jumped on Slack and said, uh, guys, we've got an error with the current version of the code for the user interface. Five minutes later, I was still talking to the customer. I got the Slack notification pop up on the top right of my screen that says, hey, we fixed it. Just tell him to refresh the page. And I could tell my user to refresh the page, and they could see the error go away. So that's an amazing customer experience. Right? That's a really, really fast response time, and customers really like that. It also gives us a really permissive approach to production access. Uh, we allow all the developers to make ch proposals of changes, but we don't let them actually make changes. So only the on-call production engineer can approve changes to our production systems, um, uh, but everybody can propose them. So if I think that um, as a developer, we need more memory, whatever it is, I can create the proposal, share this proposal with the team, <coughs> go through a review process, have that approval denied, depending. And it's an excellent developer experience, right? It's a good developer experience to have that fast feedback cycle. In addition, it gives you a stress-free on-call, right? As an on-call engineer, if I'm responsible for the uptime and the, the SLA of our system, something goes wrong, I have a really strong um, system that backs me up that lets me revert back to a known good state. Uh, that's a very, very strong way of kind of saying, hey, that went wrong. I'm sure I can bring it back to a working state. At least it's stress reduced. I don't think old call is ever stress-free, but it's definitely stress reduced. 
So, so we're coming to um, half an hour, exactly. So essentially, now it's your turn, right? I, I, I'd want you, once you've gone through this, to try these ideas out in your own infrastructure. Um, you know, talk to me on the chat today, get in touch afterwards, whatever you need to do, try these ideas out in your own system. And I think we um, can definitely have time for question. I think we have about 10 minutes of questions. So I'll stop sharing my screen and then I can see uh, whether any of you uh, have some interesting questions. Awesome, thanks so much, Bryce. Um, so we had two questions, but they vanished. Um, and I think it was primarily because you had answered them in your talk. Um, so why don't we just give it a, a minute or two and see if anybody else has anything else that they'd like to ask? Perhaps not, but um, super clear. And thank you for walking us through that. I think the, the practical examples were, were great. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's an approach that um, really, uh, if you had if you had the choice of building something that's that's the way you'd, you'd build it. It's a, it's quite a modern way of doing it, and it's I I, I really like um, having everything in one repository that defines my system. So a lot of the questions sometimes are, uh, do I keep multiple repository for the configuration? And the answer is, I really like the idea that there's a single place you can go to and know everything about your system, right? That, that there's no, is it in this repository, is it in this, this other repository, you know it's there, right? You know there's a single place. Uh, thank you, Keith. Um, so that, that's a common question. Um, the other one is um, things about what, what tooling uh, do you use? I think, is it too verbose? Um, so sometimes all these configurations files can get very verbose. Uh, in practice, you can use templating languages to make that much easier. Very cool. Um, so one question we do have that just came in is how to move into this model or try to move into this model, model without going all in or greenfielding it. Uh, and um, where to say that. Sorry, where to start uh, turning the ship, so to speak. Yeah, I would say that's that's a really good question, right? Because you have this, these legacy applications that uh, are there, these legacy systems. Um, I think the best way of doing it is this This is not incompatible with us already there. So you can start managing some of your software with this approach. And if, you're, if you have an existing system, the first thing to do is actually query your system, ask your system for information about its current state, and then put that state, that current state, in a repository. Um, so for example, if you've been managing Kubernetes, um, this is you can query Kubernetes and ask it to export its configuration and its objects, and then that you can place in a Git repository. So you'll start with, here's my running system, let me grab the state, put it in a Git repository, and, and then at, at least I can start doing things like comparing the running state to my desired state, right? Um, so that's, that's a good way of starting it. So uh, two tips, one, it, it's compatible with existing legacy approaches. Uh, you can run both of the same, use this for one part of your system query your existing system, get all that information, and then version control it. And once you've done that, then you can start driving the system from the version controlled um, side. Great. Great. Thank you. Give it another, another minute. In case folks have something to say. Um, I, I have a call today, so I've been quite snotty. But, uh, sorry, guys. Um, no worries. So my, my colleague Sonia actually pasted uh, some additional information. So if you want to have a look in the chat, there's a link. Um, you can join our community on Slack as well. We, we're pretty good at, um, we've got a quite a good community going on now in our community Slack. Uh, and we run events talking about this and talking about cloud native technology in general. Um, and, and they're free to attend and you can find them. And I think um, Sonia put, put up the link actually in the chat as well. So. I feel free to get in touch and uh, have a chat with us about um, GitOps, Kubernetes, Cloud Native, anything you'd like. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, and all of the resources are great. And yeah, reach out to reach out to Bryce and see um, if you have any other questions. And um, thank you for the presentation, that was awesome. Thank you. Um, for everybody else staying on, we are going to kick off our break. 
So we have about uh, close to 40 minutes of break time, and then we will resume sessions again at 10 a.m. What we'll do is we'll pull you into the waiting room for that next session that'll start at 10, sorry, 10 a.m. Pacific. Um, and then you can just hang out, go get some coffee, go get a snack, um, check in on that email that you've been ignoring for the last few hours, and we will be back. Thanks so much. Thank <laughs> you.